first text you guys for the invitation. Uh, I wish that we had a crowd like this in Austin, Texas. We don't have that. Uh, even though Austin, Texas is a very cool town. There's lots of people travel back and forth. Um, so, you know, I've, a lot of my research has been involved in the two script children. When this technology was first introduced in, the, in the academia and in the industry back in 1994, I remember my first AAPS poster was actually here in San Diego. People used to come to my poster telling me, like, stay away from this field because there's no job. <laughs> it sounds like it would be crazy for the drug to cost 160 degrees C. <laughs> and this is a series. I mean, you know, they used to tell me that, but you know, as a graduate student, I realized I made a choice. <laughs> <laughs> but I think there was a misunderstanding back then about this continuous process. Because yes, it's 160 degrees C. However, it's a very short period of time. Right? The industry used to do batch process. So you're only exposed to 160 degrees C for 30 seconds to two minutes. And uh, lots of drug guys are stable for that. Okay. And to give you a perspective, even in the commercial process, you know, 27 millimeter extruder, they can run 30 kilograms, 40 kilograms per hour. But at any given time, inside that machine, you're only mixing no more than 300, 400 grams at any given time. So I think the twin screw is really taking over a lot of twin screw really changed pharmaceutical process. Not just for the amorphous dispersion, but also for continuous granulation process. And this actually has been doing, you know, one of the reasons my graduate advisor, Jimmy Gini, got into two scriptures, uh, because he had a postdoc who is a chemical engineer, does polymer compounding. When she spent time in the lab, she actually joined the group at the same time as I did. She made an interesting comment. She said, pharmaceutical manufacturing process does not make sense. Everybody else does continuous process, food, plastic, right? Bomb is the only one that doesn't do that. Now I should be changing it. So I'm going to talk about some of the uh, reactive extrusion process. So basically we're using extrusion process to induce some of the uh, acid-base interactions to improve the property of homophysal dispersion. First model is actually velocity, right? Um, there are many products on the markets made by either extrusion or spray drying, and also include a micro -precipit precipitation technique. At the end of the day, they're actually nanoparticle technology. So many years ago, it launched nanoparticles was really hot. But one of the issues when you make nanoparticles, once you put it in a dosage form, it's very hard to disperse back to nanoparticles. Extrusion is opposite. You actually make a class. You know, so, so you can store them, you can handle them, you, you know. But then when the water hits those classes, the drug will supersaturate and will consume it out. They actually form the nanoparticles. Okay. And I think early days when this, this class technology came into the pharmaceutical field, you know, there was always a concern about crystallization. But in reality, a lot of drugs does not really crystallize. So once you don't have this crystallization concern during the storage, it's actually a very popular technique. I think the strategy in the most of company, early on you always do spray drying. Because you don't have enough drug, you can try uh, more, uh, another treatment. But if you look at large pharma like AB or Merck, okay, they have so much expertise, they're always trying to switch at some point. And I heard their success rate is about 60 50 percent. So they can switch half of the drug over. The failure rates is because if the drug is not stable or different PK components. Okay. So if, if the drug is melting point is really high, you may have to go to spray drying. Right? Or if the drug is not soluble in organic salt, you may be stuck with some other shoes. So however to make amorphous salt dispersions during the fusion process, there are several factors involved. There's a thermodynamic factor in the x-axis, and there's a kinetic factor. So for the thermodynamic factor, you have to get a certain temperature. Otherwise, the drug's not going to dissolve your pond. You know? So if you know your drug, you know your pond, you have to get a certain temperature from a processing perspective. Kinetic factor is because drug has to dissolve in the pond. 
the drug dissolving column is nothing different from dissolved sugar in water. You don't have to melt the sugar. If, if drugs really likes polymer, you're going to dissolve the drug way before you hit the melting point of the drug. Okay. But then this dissolution process takes time. It depends on the screw design, depends on how you mix them, depends on the drug loading. So if you don't if you don't have high enough temperature, also you don't have high enough mixing, the drug is still crystal. So to make a more facade dispersion using the extrusion process, you have to increase the temperature and also give the extensive mixing. That's why you actually dissolve the drug in the polymer. But if you go too far, the drug will degrade, right? So there's a window, there's a design space. If we look at Vloxin as a so Vloxin, even though it has two pKa's, but in, 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 in the Vloxin's absorption in the intestine actually really limited by the solid unit. In the intestine, solid unit actually is very, very low. Okay. So Kalpa has two ion group. The sphenol group is a weak acid. The salicyl group is a weak base. Okay. Kalpa is a very, very high melting point. Now, also, one thing you need to cover this compound, the moment it melts, they actually degrade. Okay. So we see the melting point here on this DLC profile. Sorry. This blue, uh, this orange line. Once it melts, and it's TGA, this green line is TGA profile. Once the truck melts, it actually degrades. Now, what's really interesting with a component, we have a significant melting point depression. If you look at this one here, so melting point is about 255, but even at 170 degrees, 180 degrees, the drug is already dissolving the polymer melt. So because Velocity likes this polymer so much, we can really rely on this melting point depression okay, to dissolve the drug. At the end of the day, in the extrusion process, we rely on the screw speed, and we set a screw design, and, and barrel to lots of this, I think this is where a lot of drug gets prematurely killed. Because in, in the small, early stage when you do small processes, the barrel temperature plays too much factor into it. But any, anyway, you, know, you use screw speed for the mixing, you, you use a heating for the barrel, and you're trying to convert. The most energy you put in helps you dissolve the drug in the pond. And you have to hit minimum amount of energy. So early on we did a small DOE, look at different barrel temperatures go from low to high, and within the barrel temperature, we admire the feed rate, and also screw speed. The larger the machine you go, the screw play more, more important though. The barrel actually is new energy. It's like in the plastics, you know, when they run metric tons per hour, you would need the barrel being heated at the very beginning. But once the process is going, you can turn off the barrel. The machine run on its own, okay? Because this mix itself creates so much heat. And from this one, you can tell, when we go to high temperature, we get amorphous material, but we start seeing a lot of degradation. At 140 degrees, you would find a sweet spot. Okay. You can play with different screw speed, and you can dissolve the drug okay, without creating too much degradation. So here, is, they're not, even though they're amorphous, they're not stable, too much degradation. Okay. Here, we have a window. This top condition actually give us amorphous without drastic degradations. Okay. Now, if we look at degradation of Molossian, actually it break off on this amine, which actually is really strange. Typically, amine actually is very, very stable, right? And there's, I'm going to come back to this. You know, there's a reason for that. And during the process, we actually know if it's degrading or not because the extruder has come out with an air bubble. And so if we just look at from a processing perspective, we can't really totally get a real degradation, right? So this is the best we can do with process. We have two bends. We're trying to purposefully remove moisture from Copolco. Okay? And here's the extrusion, the kneading elements. So basically, most of the drug is dissolved here. Once it dissolves, we're trying to get the drug to come out of the as quick as quick as it can. And here's, here's what we can do with process, right? At certain screw speed, the more, the, the more, the higher the feed rate, we have to reduce the energy. Okay? 
you can reduce the zeta level, all of a sudden it's not fully crystalline. And you have, but then to make that fully amorphous, you're saying dealing with all the degradation. As you can see here, uh, four grams per minute is, is clear, and when you go to five grams per minute, actually it's opaque, it's not fully crystal. So we went to live streams in New Jersey, actually we started looking at different processes. Some of the processes we're looking at, we're actually doing downstream feeding, we said, well, we can melt polymer first, then we can add a drug. We were running a process where drug inside the extruder is not set to seconds. So on the average, it's about 20 seconds. And actually, it's very fast. Um, but with all that, we even tried to counter load the two screw shooters. We still couldn't get rid of all the impurities. The best we can do is about 2% degradation. Then we start looking at this more. What can we do from a chemistry perspective? Well, we found an article back in 1996. Molossi actually does not degrade very quickly at high pH. And there's but earlier on, I mentioned about block and degrade. You know, AMI is typically very stable because of this resonance structure of AMI, right? There's a single pair of electrons from in the oxygen. But in the case of molossin, because each molecular hydrogen bond, that actually made molossin cannot be so stable. Okay? <coughs> now, in the ionized state, molossin actually is quite stable because this intramolecular hydrogen bond and this AMI actually gets scooped in that ring structure. That's one of the reasons molossin can actually is stable. <coughs> at high pH. And here's an example, you know, we're looking at solution state stability. In point one oh my hydrochloric acid, 60 degrees C, they drop like crazy. But then you go to high pH, when that OH group is ionized, it's very stable. So we thought, why can't we just put something that will react? We thought of two materials. One is educated EPO has a tertiary amine group. Right here. Yeah. Now, one is just magnesium. But magnesium is actually used as a common iron on several pharmaceutical drugs. Yeah. And what's interesting, if I look at PK, we know they're going to react. Right? So, and I'll come back to some. So, basically, briefly, you know, when we have one to one molar ratio, we actually be able to get rid of all the degradation. So what's happening here, we actually form salt, in situ salt, during the extrusion process. Okay? And look, look how stable they are, you know, one to one molar ratio especially. When we prepare a physical mixture between molossicam and magnumin, so this this one here is uh, molossicam on the top. After melting, they actually degrades, right? This is a melting point of magnumin, 129 degrees. And when we mix those two, the actions are melting. Those two actions are quite visible. They will dissolve. Okay. Right here. They're actually below the melting point of either one of the compounds. And this is what I showed you guys earlier with molossin by itself. The moment it melts, it degrades. Now, when you have in the presence of magnesium, because magnesium and molossin itself has a melting point depression. All of a sudden now you actually you have a window where they turn into a liquid before they start degrading. So basically this interaction really broadened up our processing windows. Okay. Uh, the extruded is actually is very stable. I'm lost them by itself, you can dissolve them, they don't they don't crystallize. Uh, this one here, after three months storage, this is a one to one molar ratio, after three months storage. They still remain um, amorphous, and then we don't see any degradation. Another thing interesting because now we actually form an in situ salt, so the extrudates actually behaves better. When we put in the aqueous media, actually they were wet. So if you look at this is a non secret dissolution. Um, Lots of solid beauty is, is quite low, uh, both even at pH 5.5. So when we have this amorphous solid dispersion with magnesium in there, they actually stay super saturated much longer. Now, I want to clarify one thing because if you look, you know, when we take a dissolution sample, it goes to a 0.2 micron filter. So the concentration here actually is free drug, nanoparticles, everything in there. Okay? It's not necessarily just free drug only. I should have lots of non-sync dissolution tests 
you, you're, you, you're capturing all the narrow margins, being, being an example. In comparison, blocks and by themselves will be, will be all like you know, they stay super sized, but then they crash down pretty quickly. And then crystalline blocks can't really doesn't do anything there. Okay. So going back to, if you look at velocity and solubility profile, solubility is very low. Once you hit pH you know, 6, it start to go higher. One thing we find out interesting, you know, in the presence of magnesium, solubility is higher just because microenvironment pH effect. Magnesium itself will serve as buffering agent and increase the solubility. We also find something very interesting when we have copolymer being present. Copolymer itself actually will interact with magnesium and increase solubility. We're actually really looking and trying to find, understand what's happening there. Okay. Another advantage of magnesium is once we form a situ salt, we can actually put more molluscan in the formula. So we can go up the increase structure load up to 20%, which we can never do just using molluscan only. Okay. Um, so the salt actually has a higher solubility in the copolymer than the uh, than the uh, molluscan by itself. So here's the summary on the study number one. Now, this compound degrades by hydrolysis, and the best we can do was 97% purity. Okay. But this in situ interaction was mechanism. Um, we were able to minimize degradation, actually totally got rid of degradation. Okay. Um, you know, process only carried us so far. By this in situ reaction, we got rid of the degradation. Okay. And also, we can increase the uh, load of the uh, of the drug. And here's a, some of the reference. This work has been published about a year ago. And in my second case study, actually, is on naproxen. You know, it's actually really interesting. Lots of companies out there are trying to achieve quicker onset of naproxen. So if you buy naproxen on the market. You will see the right in naproxen, you will see naproxen sodium. You will also see, I believe there's some naproxen actually in the soft gel, liquid gel capsule, quicker onset. Okay. And there are also naproxen on both of these versions. But then naproxen on both of these versions have been some issues. Naproxen actually crystallizes very, very quickly. It's very hard to maintain and be stable. Part of the reason because you got two benzene here that will stack on top of each other. And you have two couples, so you move from hydrogen bond. Naproxen by itself, you actually could not make amorphous naproxen, either using melting, melt cringe, or spray drying. Okay. Um, it's actually very, very difficult. Okay. Um, so in the case of naproxen, you know, one thing we were thinking, like, well, you know, maybe we can ionize this. React, again, in this case here, we're looking at magnesium as a counter iron again. Okay? Uh, because you know, their pK is, is different enough for them to actually form a situ salt. So here's the, here's the process we're doing. Uh, we're looking at, so we're using, we're actually looking at three different polymers PVPK30, Copolvidon, and Solid Plus right, as a polymer. And as far as drug, uh, naproxen and magnesium, we investigate different uh, moderations here. Uh, and then it's just intrusion process. And after that, we'll do all the physical calculations and then dissolution testing. What's interesting here is naproxone melts. Uh, if you cool them down in the second heating, they melt again because naproxone actually crystallizes so quickly. You can never get, no matter how fast you plant, unless you drop them in liquid nitrogen, otherwise, they always crystallize. You look at magnesium at its own melting point. Now, similar to the uh, case I discussed earlier, when you mix them together, let's look at this one to one molar ratios. Actually, there's a significant melting point in pressure as well. Okay. Now, all of those mixtures, once you have them together, when you go through second heating, they actually do not crystallize. You can actually make a focus material. When we measure the class transition temperature as a function of uh, naproxen to the naproxen percentage in the naproxen magnesium mixtures, it's a positive deviation. So that's indicative that it's very strong interaction. Again, it's acid-base interaction. Right? 
these little kind of hostage microscope. Okay. Um, this is room temperature. Once we heat at this point, they actually there's a melting point depression. Um, now, fraction actually will dissolve. In, in, it will dissolve first. And then they actually will form a new crystalline phase. So, 138 degrees C, sorry, 135, around 135 degrees C, it's actually, so this is melting, recrystallize, then they will melt it again. Okay? This is a new phase they form, and this new phase, we believe it's just the practical making the salt, has a new melting point about 160 degrees C. And this is, again, in situ interactions. When we look at FTIR analysis, if you look at that practice itself, here is a company of stress, unionized carbon city from that practice. Okay. Now, once we form a salt, if you look at this one-to-one -one ratio, right, what's happened in this one-to-one -one region, this green line here, in this green line here, so this is uh, from the uh, carbonyl stretch from naproxen. But once we form salt, when this green line, it actually moved over to the ionized. So from FTIR, we confirm it, it is in the ionized state because there was, you know, always there was discussion about hydrogen bond versus ionization. Uh, I think based on the PKA, most likely they're ionized. It, it is ionized. When we have this mixture, one to one molar ratios, actually we have the whole range. Unless you are in extreme ratios, otherwise they're stable. So this, we're using Valpranch, Naproxen, and Megumin. The Melt-Cranch material actually is remain stable. Um, that's the initial sort of seven months storage. Okay. And the most stable is one to one ratio, or 10 to 7 ratio. Those are most stable. But I think for the purpose of our study, originally, you know, we sell online, unless there's a particular reason, we can stay one to one ratio. Just convert all the naproxen to an ionized state. Okay? The 10 to 1, the 7 to 1 give us the best performance. And that's our final screw designs. So we're heating about 150 to 160 degrees C in the barrel. The material counter, we don't use the dye, we just catch the, the shoot it. Right? The, the solid one. In this extrusion, now we have polymers, and we see the same thing as far as not practicing this carbon yellow. Same type of ionizations, same type of reactions. And the presence of polymer actually did not interfere with the uh, interaction between not practicing and methane. We also use XPS to confirm the ionization state of not practicing. That's, that's, that's confirmed. So when we run the dissolution, this actually gets really interesting. This is not seen the dissolution test. On the right, if we find out that this, the amorphous solid dispersion actually is worse than the physical mixture, one thing what's happened is when we had the amorphous solid dispersion in the aqueous media, that process crystallized so quickly, it actually just stay on the surface. All the grain we put actually it's worse. They don't really disperse anymore. Actually, it's, it's traditional amorphous solid dispersion on the right actually is worse. Than the, amorphous, than, than, the, than the physical mixture. But what's happened um, right here is when we have the, in the, in the presence of light okay, it wets very quickly and this stays super, this, we achieve higher solubility. Again, the solubility is not just a free drug, but also nanoparticles on that practice. Okay. So this is just another example where when two materials react, it will help in the wetting and also helps the formation of nanoparticles. And we put them up on stability. Okay. No mag so this is the initial time point. So without magnumin, after four months storage, actually they will they will, they will crystallize because naproxen has is a very fast crystallizer. In the case of magnumins, the best one we find out actually is um, PVP works well. And copolymer works well. We, we have a very crystallization in solid plus. Okay. I think it has a lot to do with solid plus as a very low glass temperature. Okay. In the case of copolymer and polymer, both are actually stable. Okay. So the 
again, you know, in the case study two, it's, it's in other examples, we're relying on the situ reaction uh, to change the possibility of molten salt dispersion. Some other research actually we're looking at using extrusions, for example, to induce interaction between the clay and polymer. So, you know, I, I think um, extrusion is actually a very interesting process and a very interesting tool. And because, because of the process condition, you can actually induce a lot of interactions um, that can solve some of the uh, formation challenges. That's my last slide. Thank you.